Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ed Iacobucci, and it's my pleasure and honor to serve a as the Dean of uh, the Faculty of Law, University of Toronto. To begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Thank you, everyone, for coming here tonight. Uh, the Grand Moot is one of the highlights of the academic year. Advocacy is a big part of what we do here at the law school, and the Grand Moot is our opportunity to showcase some of our most impressive advocates. The Chief Justices, we have a lot of Chief Justices here this evening. Uh, the two student uh, co-Chief Justices of the, mooting pro uh, of the mooting program have put together a terrific, uh, challenging, uh, and very topical uh, problem. Um, you'll be hearing more about the problem from them shortly. Before I turn it over to them, though, I'd like to offer several thank yous, beginning with our uh, distinguished panel of justices. We've got the Chief Justice of Canada, the Right Honorable Richard Wagner, the Chief Justice of Ontario, the Honorable George Strathy, uh, the, the Justice of the Ontario Superior Court of Justice, the Honorable Brees Davis. Um, it's a special honor, I think, to have such a distinguished panel with us tonight. Um, to the Mooters, I want to say congratulations and thank you in advance. Uh, we have Spence Colburn and Ju Julie Lowenstein for the appellant, Eileen Church Carson and Will Maidman for the respondent. Congratulations, and we look forward to hearing from you. And a special thank you to our uh, co-chief justices. Uh, this is a lot of work that goes into uh, this evening, certainly by the Mooters, uh, but also by the chief justices who put together this wonderful problem. So thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you also to our assistant dean academic, Sarah Faraday, for everything that you've done to make this evening a success. And then finally, thank you to the McCarthy's. Uh, they've been a long, um, and a uh, loyal supporter of this event. Uh, it reflects, I know, your emphasis on advocacy, and we deeply appreciate not only the financial support, but also the support in helping the Mooters prepare for this evening. So thank you to our friends from McCarthy, McCarthy's. I will now hand the proceedings over to our Chief Justices. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alyssa Holmes. My name is Sue Rao. And we are the co-chief justices of the Grand Moot. Uh, we would just like to begin by echoing Dean Iacobucci's thanks to our sponsor, McCarthy Tatro, uh, for their continued support of the Grand Moot. And with that, uh, although I'm sure you've all diligently studied this year's Grand Moot problem, we're here to give you a brief overview just to refresh everyone's memory about the issues you'll see argued before you tonight. This appeal challenges the constitutionality of the Structured Intervention Act, which was recently enacted in the country of Flavel. The appellant in this case is the Flavelian Civil Liberties Association, a nonprofit advocacy group operating in the Flavelian province of Falconer. The respondent is the Attorney General of Flavel. Flavel is a fictitious nation, and Falconer is a fictitious province of Flavel. Flavel is a parliamentary democracy which has a system of government, legislative history, and judicial history which is functionally equivalent to that of Canada. Before the Structured Intervention Act, Flavelian correctional facilities utilized a system of administrative segregation which was administered pursuant to a piece of legislation entitled the Segregation Act. Under this act, inmates were placed in administrative segregation and would be in small segregation cells on the basis of various non-disciplinary grounds, including the maintenance of staff and inmate safety and the security of the correctional institution. Inmates placed into administrative segregation could be confined to these small cells for a maximum of 22 hours per day with minimal opportunity for human interaction. The periods of confinement in such cells were theoretically indefinite. In late 2017, this court, the Supreme Court of Flavel, which is the highest court in the nation, declared the system of administrative segregation in correctional facilities to be unconstitutional. The Supreme Court found that the Segregation Act violated the Flavelian Charter of Rights and Freedoms because the previous system of correctional segregation unjustifiably deprived inmates of their rights under Section 7 of the Charter. 
which guarantees a right not to be deprived of life, liberty, or security of the person, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. In response to this ruling, the Flavellian Parliament passed new legislation entitled the Structured Intervention Act, which replaces the previous system of administrative segregation with a new system of structured intervention units, also known as SIUs. It is this new legislation which is at issue tonight. Under the Structured Intervention Act, a staff member may authorize the transfer of an inmate into an SIU only if the staff member is satisfied that there is no reasonable alternative to confinement in an SIU and the staff member believes one of three things. First, that the inmate would jeopardize the safety of any person or the security of the institution. Second, that allowing the inmate to remain in general population would jeopardize the inmate's safety. Or third, that allowing the inmate to remain in general population could interfere with an ongoing criminal or disciplinary investigation. In contrast to the previous Segregation Act, the Structured Intervention Act provides new protections for inmates. Under the Structured Intervention Act, inmates placed in SIUs are now entitled to a minimum of four hours outside their cell. At least two of these hours must include a meaningful opportunity to interact with others. Compliance with these minimum requirements is subject to a number of exceptions, including where the inmate refuses the opportunity, does not comply with reasonable instructions to ensure safety, or in other prescribed circumstances. While there is no hard limit to how long inmates may be confined in an SIU, the decision to maintain an inmate in an SIU is subject to a system of regular review. In determining the safety of an inmate, the decision maker has the discretion to consider the inmate's mental and physical health. In this case, the appellant, the Flavellian Civil Liberties Association, has challenged the constitutionality of the Structured Intervention Act on the basis that it unjustifiably infringes inmates' rights under the Charter. The appellant submits that the Act infringes inmates' Section 7 rights as they are deprived of liberty and security of the person in a manner which does not accord with the principles of fundamental justice. The appellant also submits that the Structured Intervention Act is in breach of the Section 12 guarantee against cruel and unusual treatment. In the event that the court finds that Section 7 is infringed, the respondent, Attorney General of Flavel, submits that the infringement is justified under Section 1 of the Charter, which allows for a law to justifiably infringe these Charter rights if the limit on the right can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. The challenge to the constitutionality of the Structured Intervention Act was first heard at the Superior Court of Falconer by Justice Scheck. At trial, Justice Scheck admitted into evidence a report by Dr. A. R. Smith on the effects of solitary confinement and witness testimony from a Flavellian Correctional Services officer, Officer Halau. Justice Scheck found that the act infringed Section 7 because it deprived inmates of liberty and security of the person and that the deprivation did not accord with the principles of fundamental justice because the deprivation was overbroad in relation to the act's purpose of promoting safety. She also found that the act infringed Section 12 because there was a possibility of prolonged solitary confinement and that this possibility was sufficient for placement in an SIU to constitute cruel and unusual treatment. She held that neither infringement could be justified under Section 1, writing that since the infringements of Section 7 and Section 12 are very serious, no infringing legislation would ever satisfy the minimal impairment requirement needed for Section 1. Having found that the Structured Intervention Act unjustifiably infringed Section 7 and 12, Justice Scheck held that the appropriate remedy was to impose a 15-day limit on inmates' placement in an SIU. The Respondent Attorney General of Flavel appealed Justice Scheck's decision, and the appeal was heard by a three-judge panel, three panel at the Falconer Court of Appeal. The majority of the court found that there was no infringement of either Section 7 or 12, while the dissent found that there was a Section 7 infringement and no infringement of Section 12. For the majority of the Court of Appeal, Justice Wang wrote that there was no Section 7 infringement. The majority found that the Structured Intervention Act only deprived inmates of their liberty interest, not their security of the person interest, and that any such deprivation of liberty accorded with the principles of fundamental justice, because the Act has a fair and independent review process. 
the majority of the court agreed with Justice Choi's dissenting opinion that Section 12 was not infringed. Justice Choi wrote that the Structured Intervention Act did not constitute cruel and unusual treatment because the threshold for Section 12 to be infringed was high and because SIUs do not outrage societal standards of decency. In Obiter, the majority of the court wrote that even if they had found a Section 7 infringement, this infringement would nevertheless be justified under Section 1 of the Charter. In his decision, Justice Wang noted that this was a case in which public good, a matter not considered under Section 7, could justify a deprivation of liberty or security of the person under Section 1. Following the decision of the Faulkner Court of Appeal, the Flavellian Civil Liberties Association appealed the decision to this court, the Supreme Court of Flavel. At this time, I would ask that you please switch your cell phones to silent. We will now cede the floor to the judges and our four mooters, Spence Colburn, Julie Lowenstein, Eileen Church Carson, and William Maidment. Good afternoon, everybody. The case of um, Corporation of the Flavillian Civil Liberties Association and Her Majesty the Queen, as represented by the Attorney General of Flavel, for the appellant. Who's for the appellant? What's your name? Julie Lovenstein. And your colleague? And for the respondent? Yes. Good evening, Justices. My name is Julie Lowenstein, and I represent the appellant, the Flavellian Civil Liberties Association, alongside my co-counsel, Spence Colburn. Justices, humans need meaningful social interaction in order to maintain mental health. Prolonged solitary confinement or isolation for more than 22 hours a day, for longer than 15 days, thwarts what psychologists call the human need to connect and inflicts severe and often permanent harm onto some of the most vulnerable people in Flavel. In 2017, just two years ago, this court struck down Flavel's previous system of administrative segregation, the Segregation Act. This court found that the act was unconstitutional under Section 7 of the Flavellian Charter of Rights and Freedoms because it authorized solitary confinement for indefinite periods of time with no external oversight. In response, Flavel has implemented a new system of administrative segregation 
under the Structured Intervention Act. The question in this appeal is whether Flavel has gone far enough to fix the constitutional deficiencies of the prior regime. Our position is that Flavel must go further. The Structured Intervention Act still expressly authorizes prolonged solitary confinement, and the first opportunity for external review does not come until 90 days after an inmate has been segregated. Can I just clarify something? Um, do you acknowledge that the statute as it, as it exists now, leaving aside the exceptions, does not impose solitary confinement, but the four hours outside the cell? Is that, is that a state of affairs that you can call solitary confinement? Chief Justice Strathy, the statute cannot be considered in isolation from the exceptions that it contains. It's important to note that this act authorizes prolonged solitary confinement on its face. I guess just to clarify, is it the exceptions that make it solitary confinement? Yes. So, but for the exceptions, the statute would not impose solitary confinement? Yes. Okay. That is correct. But given that the exceptions are in this act, we must impose a 15-day time limit in order to prevent violations of the Charter. And more specifically, this Act violates the Charter in two ways. First, this Act violates inmates' rights to liberty and security of the person in contravention of Section 7. And second, it authorizes cruel and unusual treatment in contravention of Section Do you think that uh, that notion has evolved since uh, the enactment of the Charter in 1982? Yes, Justice, it has evolved. Uh, my co-counsel, Ms. Colburn, will be addressing Section 12 in detail, um, but I will just briefly say that it has evolved such that we now see solitary confinement as outraging standards of societal decency. Which was not the case in 1982. Um, perhaps not, but what is important is that it is the case now. Can I just ask you, um, on the issue of what you say has to happen, is your position that under no circumstances could someone be um, subjected to more than 15 days of structured intervention, or is, or is it, as Justice, Chief Justice Strathy has asked, is it dependent on someone being denied more than two hours out of the cell for 15 days? More than four hours out of the cell for 15 days? The question before this court today is whether the Structured Intervention Act creates the possibility of solitary confinement beyond 15 days. We are not concerned with whether the act mandates this in every situation, but rather whether it creates the possibility for even one person hypothetically to be subjected to solitary confinement for longer than 15 days. And by that you mean having been denied what is entitled to them in section 36 for more than 15 days. Yes. And what's your position if on one day they're given these, the four hours out of the cell, but for three days they're not, and then for one day they are, does it have to be 15 in a row or is it 15 total? It has to be 15 in a row. And it's important to note that the exceptions to the four hours outside the cell time in Section 37 of the Act include situations that are not uncommon in the prison context. These include situations of riots or work refusals, and also situations where inmates might choose not to leave their cells or where CSF officials might deem an inmate not to be capable of complying with reasonable safety instructions. These exceptions are notable given the evidence before this court that there is a high proportion of inmates in segregation with mental illness, and this might cause an inmate not to leave the cell or cause CSF to view the inmate as not being capable of complying with reasonable safety instructions. Justice Scheck at the application found that this act creates a possibility of prolonged solitary confinement, and it is that possibility that renders the act unconstitutional on its face. So turning now to Section 7, 
My submissions on section seven can be found at paragraph 20 of the appellant's factum. Legislation will violate section seven where it causes a deprivation of the important interests of life, liberty, or security of the person in a manner that does not conform with the principles of fundamental justice. Here, the act on its face causes deprivations of both liberty and security of the person. The government of Flavel has rightly conceded that the act deprives segregated inmates of their liberty, and indeed, this point is essentially uncontestable. However, I'll just briefly note that the deprivation of liberty in this case is a serious one. As the Court of Appeal for Ontario put it in the Queen and Olson case, segregation amounts to confining an inmate to a prison within the prison. Given the severely restricted nature of segregation, several Canadian courts, including the Court of Appeal for Ontario in Boone in Ontario and the Ontario Superior Court in the Canadian Civil Liberties Association in Canada case, have confirmed that segregation amounts to a serious deprivation of liberty and a serious deprivation of liberty is harder to justify at the section one and principles of fundamental justice stages. Can it be justified in, in other circumstances? It could theoretically, but it will not be justified in this case. I'll turn now to security of the person and this submission begins at paragraph 22 of the appellant's factum. Just as you're getting into that, can I just raise with you that your friend's submission that, that the record the record as it exists does not support uh, that security of the person is engaged, that you're looking at stale evidence that has no application to this regime. What's your response to that submission? Chief Justice McLaughlin was clear in Bedford that the standard for causation under Section 7 is a sufficient causal connection. And this is satisfied by a reasonable inference drawn on the balance of probabilities. What this means is that the impugned government action or legislation does not need to be the only or the dominant cause of the deprivation at hand, and it is traditionally not a high bar to meet. Before this court, we have evidence from Dr. Smith that solitary confinement causes severe physical and serious psychological damage. In solitary confinement, inmates begin to lose touch with reality. They become paranoid and delusional, they can no longer sleep, some hallucinate and hear voices. After being deprived of socialization for such a prolonged period, inmates can no longer cope with the noises or social demands of general population if they are released. Many will experience heightened anxiety, depression, increased suicidality, and self-harm. Those statistics, though, were that evidence dealt with a, regi a regime in which uh, 22 hours was the, was the standard. Yes. There's no evidence that would assist us in understanding what the, what the circumstances would be under the standard of this legislation. Yes. And we are concerned with the hypothetical possibility of an inmate who is in solitary confinement for more than 22 hours a day. I understand the facts also show that um, the general population also suffered of the same problems even though they were, they were not in confinement. Yes. So what, what, how do you deal with that? Yes, Chief Justice Wagner, they do. And while it's true that some of these effects might exist in general population, the evidence before this court establishes that they are more pronounced in segregation and that they are often permanent in segregation. We have evidence uh, that establishes significant harm connected to solitary confinement. And as Justice Leake con least concluded in the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association case uh, at the BC Supreme Court, it is a matter of common sense that there is a sufficient causal connection between this well-established medical evidence uh, and a deprivation of security of the person. Can I just pick up on a question that you were asked by Chief Justice Strathy? Um, it seems that the evidence um, from Dr. Smith is based on a constellation of factors under the old regime, which included deprivation for 22 hours, um, the sort of indefinite nature of it, not no review, not knowing when you're going to get out. Uh, is, do we have any evidence 
to be able to tease those out to know whether the changes that have been made to some of those aspects would alleviate the harm that he identified based on all of those factors existing at once. We don't have specific evidence on that point, Justice Davis, but we do have sufficient medical evidence uh, cited by Dr. Smith that solitary confinement causes severe deprivations of security of the person, and we are concerned with the hypothetical possibility. Read cumulatively, it's clear that the Structured Intervention Act creates the possibility that someone would be subjected to more than 22 hours per day in a cell for longer than 15 days. Does that possibility only arise if um, the correctional service doesn't properly um, uh, enforce or doesn't properly apply the legislation? Does it necessarily involve an abuse of the legislation for that possibility to arise? No, Justice, it does not. We do not submit that maladministration is what renders this act unconstitutional. Rather, it's the combination of the exceptions and the provisions which create the possibility that even one person in Flavel could be subject to prolonged and indefinite solitary confinement. And on this point, I would court the, uh, point the court back to the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in the Queen and Big M Drug Mart, which was a foundational constitutional case where Chief Justice Dixon stressed how crucial it is that courts be able to strike down laws on a hypothetical basis where they expressly authorize conduct that does not comply with the Charter. Justices, the deprivations of liberty and security of the person before this court today can only be constitutional if they comply with the principles of fundamental justice. I'll move now to this part of my analysis, which begins at paragraph 27 of the Appellant's Factum. The principles of fundamental justice are the basic principles of our judicial system and legal process. They demand that laws that interfere with the important Section 7 interests of life, liberty, and security of the person not be overbroad, not be grossly disproportionate, uh, not be arbitrary, and not be procedurally unfair. In this case, the Structured Intervention Act is overbroad and grossly disproportionate, and it is also procedurally unfair. However, I'll just briefly note that gross disproportionality is generally analyzed under Section 12 instead of Section 7, and therefore my co-counsel will address this portion of our argument. I'll begin with overbreadth. This submission begins at paragraph 29 of the appellant's factum. Legislation will be overbroad if it has at least one effect that is not connected to its stated purpose. Here, the stated purposes of the act are to increase safety and preserve the integrity of ongoing investigations. Now, we recognize that prisons can be dangerous at times and that the short-term isolation of, in of inmates may increase safety in some circumstances. However, prolonged solitary confinement <coughs> simply does not increase safety. In fact, it undermines safety by harming inmates and it also creates an increased resentment and tension within the institution, which leads inmates to face a heightened risk of assault. This I understand that many of those inmates uh, voluntarily wanted to be put in segregation. So how do you, um, how do you deal with that uh, in terms of safety? Those want to be there because they will be more safe. Others, and you mentioned that uh, it's, it, it would be cruel and unusual. So how do you deal with that? How do you take in co into consideration the other interest? Inmates who admit themselves voluntarily to segregation, once in segregation, become subject to all of the provisions of the act. So we do not differ our analysis for those inmates. Um, in terms of your, the portion of your question about the interests of other inmates, we recognize that prisons can be dangerous places. Uh, and once again, that isolation may serve a purpose to increase safety within 15 days. However, we cannot accept the harms that prolonged isolation causes, and Flavel will simply have to come up with some more creative alternatives. We realize this might be an area of research for Parliament, but some examples that might come to mind include supervised time outdoors or in a rec room, behavioral therapy with a trained clinician, either one-on-one -on -one or in a group, supervised time with increased numbers of guards who can prevent conflict, Keeping someone isolated for more than 15 days is simply not an option. 
we're all the time talking about people falling within the exceptions, not the general. Yes, Chief Justice Strabi, we are concerned with the one potential Flavellian who falls through the cracks. Every Flavellian has the right to constitutional laws, and since this act expressly authorizes unconstitutional conduct, it cannot surpass even the Even the Flavellian who says, I want to stay in my cell because I don't want to go out there. Yes, Chief Justice Strabi, we have evidence that solitary confinement causes mental illness uh, and psychological harm in inmates, it's quite possible that an inmate might voluntarily admit themselves, then experience the harms of segregation and choose not to leave while further uh, experiencing psychological threats. But both that one hypothetical Flavellian, don't they have access to a writ of habeas corpus to challenge uh, their treatment if they say that it doesn't comply with the charter? Yes, Justice Davis, they do. However, habeas corpus is not enough to save this legislation from constitutional deficiencies. As Justice Lease concluded in the BCCLA decision, habeas corpus is not an answer to constitutional holes, and we should not put the onus on prisoners to challenge uh, their confinement. Rather, the principles of fundamental justice demand meaningful and prompt independent review of segregation decisions. Does and that I mean judicial review or any review? For the purposes, we'll for our submissions, it means any external review. Justice Louise Arbour, in her commission into certain events at the Kingston Prison for Women, concluded that judicial review was necessary of segregation decisions because of the immense impact that those decisions have on individuals. We would submit that any form ex of external review is sufficient, but judicial review would be welcome. And I will spend the balance of my time uh, getting into procedural fairness in a little bit more depth. The guarantee that laws that interfere with Section 7 interests will be procedurally fair is a context-specific inquiry. It considers both the context and the seriousness of the violations at hand and is case-specific. In this case, in order to be sufficiently procedurally fair, Segregation decisions must be subject to external review at the earliest possible time and at the very least within seven days. This is because we have evidence that the harms of solitary confinement can manifest within seven days. And we find the origins for this requirement in a number of sources. First, because of the immense impact that segregation has on an individual's life, Several Canadian courts have concluded that meaningful and prompt external review is required. These include the Ontario Superior Court in CCLA, the BC Supreme and Appeal Courts in BCCLA, and the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench in the Ham and Attorney General case. F uh, second, the Mandela Rules, which mark the minimum acceptable standard for treatment of prisoners, mandate that segregation be subject to external review. These are relevant. And finally, independent research, such as Justice Louise Arbour's commission, which I mentioned earlier, also establishes this requirement under Section 7. Justices, external review that comes 90 days after an inmate has been segregated is simply too late to be of any assistance to the inmate. And for this reason, it fails the analysis under the principles of fundamental justice. You're, you're assuming that the previous reviews are somehow inadequate. Yes, Chief Justice Strathy, I see I'm at the end of my time, if I could have a brief indulgence to answer your question. In her report, Justice Arbour concluded that internal review often amounted to a rubber stamp and that the very existence of a lengthy segregation served as a justification for its continuance. It's for these reasons that courts, the Mandela rules, and independent researchers have concluded that external review is necessary. And if there are no further questions, those are my submissions, and Ms. Colburn will continue with the appellant's argument. Thank you very much. Good evening, Justices. Good evening. 
My name is Spence Colburn, and I will be presenting the appellant's submissions on Section 12 of the Charter and Section 1. My submissions begin at paragraph 35 of the appellant's factum. Section 12 of the Charter protects against cruel and unusual treatment or punishment. In this case, the Attorney General of Flavel has conceded that a placement in structured intervention constitutes treatment so as to engage Section 12, and so my submissions will focus on whether that treatment is cruel and unusual. And I will address your point, Chief Justice Wagner, that what is cruel and unusual has evolved since 1982. The Supreme Court of Canada set out the test for finding a Section 12 violation as early as 1987 in the Queen and Smith, Treatment will be considered cruel and unusual where it meets two conceptions of the same test. It is grossly disproportionate, or to put it another way, it is so excessive as to outrage societal standards of decency. And it is important to note first that under Section 12, we look to the effect of treatment or punishment and not the legitimacy of the reasons for imposing it, as the Ontario Court of Appeal has recognized in Turin, Canada, and the Ogamin and Ontario case. As Justice Lemaire stated in The Queen and Smith, punishment is or is not cruel and unusual, irrespective of why that violation has taken place. In this case, the FCLA challenges new legislation, and so the question for this court is whether the Structured Intervention Act's reasonably foreseeable applications will impose cruel and unusual treatment. Following the Supreme Court of Canada's approach in The Queen and Nur and The Queen and Ferguson. Our position is that if this act's reasonably foreseeable application authorizes prolonged and indefinite solitary confinement in some cases, or even in one case, the law must fail because the harms that this practice inflicts are so extreme and often irreversible that a law which authorizes it can never be permitted to remain on the books in Flavel. My submissions will be framed to establish that first, prolonged and indefinite solitary confinement is cruel and unusual, according to the test set out in the Queen and Smith, and that second, the legislative safeguards within this act are insufficient to prevent the harm that this practice inflicts. And the first prong of my argument begins at paragraph 46 of the appellant's factum. When denied social stimulation for a prolonged period of time, human beings develop a dangerous mix of health problems with devastating and often permanent results. By the time he was released, after spending four and a half years in solitary confinement in a Canadian prison, Adam Capet had nearly lost the ability to speak. Edward Snowshoe was never released, and he hanged himself in his segregation cell. So did Ashley Smith, and so did Christopher Roy. In Flavel, inmates in segregation attempt suicide at twice the rate of other inmates, and as many as 90% of segregated inmates will experience the harms of solitary confinement. Prolonged isolation causes entirely new psychological conditions to develop in inmates with no known history of mental illness, but as Dr. Smith's evidence reflects, it also exacerbates pre-existing conditions and therefore has the greatest impact on individuals with a history of mental illness and self-harm. Most cases are, are uh, terrible, but uh, you also um, have to consider the cases of people who need to be in confinement for their own safety. So am I to understand that the key to resolve the issue is the review of the confinement uh, conditions? Um, for the purposes of Section 7, independent review would aid to cure the act of its procedural unfairness. But for the purposes of Section 12, which is framed as an absolute prohibition, independent review would not cure this legislation, and only a hard time limit would accord with the absolute nature of Section 12's prohibition. And what's that time limit? That time limit is 15 days. Um, so nothing short of what the, uh, what the UN has declared to be torture would be cruel and unusual? The reason that the Mandela rules, which reflect the international community's consensus on the acceptable treatment of prisoners, affix upon a standard of 15 days is because it's at this point that the medical literature agrees that most of the harms of solitary confinement become permanent. That is why that is the number that we have chosen. And, and so that I understand this then, at the end of 15 days, what's supposed to happen? With respect to individuals who um, hypothetically may be so dangerous that they can never interact safely with others in general population, our primary position is that that evidence is not before this court today. 
Primarily, we have evidence of individuals who are mentally ill and vulnerable, who are being segregated and left there, not because they are dangerous, but because once they are segregated, it simply becomes impossible to release them back into the general population. And that is because they are targeted as being vulnerable for having been segregated. Then they have to be transferred to another institution, which takes months while they endure further harms in solitary confinement. However, to the extent that those rare cases do exist, we would not say that Flavel simply has to release those inmates back into the general population where they were, will either harm others or be harmed, but rather that Flavel must devise alternate solutions. In the BCCLA in Canada case, Justice Leask of the British Columbia Supreme Court canvassed a number of alternatives to prolonged segregation that we would submit are relevant to this case. And those would include fixing Flavel's currently broken transfer process and improving mental health care within the institution. The disproportionate number of inmates who are mentally ill that are segregated suggests that Flavel replaces proper mental health care with isolation, and this cannot be considered acceptable. Can you, so, sorry. You've referred to some of the uh, evidence about the harmful effects of uh, solitary confinement. Certainly we can take judicial notice that prisons are dangerous places and unforeseen events happen in prisons and sometimes prison authorities have to take unusual steps for the protection of everyone. The case law, at least some of which is referred to by your friends, uh, Olson, for example, Queen and Marriott, MacArthur, indicate that prison uh, authorities, uh, it's not cruel and unusual for pr prison authorities to take exceptional measures in these types of circumstances. Do you, how do you distinguish those cases or do you just say they're wrongly decided? We would rather adopt the approach that has been taken by the Ontario Court of Appeal in Tour in Canada and the recent CCLA in Canada case, which rejects a consideration of the reason for segregation under Section 12. That is a consideration more properly left for Section 1. Um, however, we would also note that the evolution of the case law um, has shifted along with medical evidence that has come to light and that in the case of Olson, for example, such psychological evidence was not present presented before the court and that the standard has changed. And we now know that prolonged isolation carries with it such an extreme cost to the individual that it cannot be authorized by law in a free and democratic society. And I will address that evolution now in my submissions. In the Queen and Smith, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized that Section 12 is a contextual standard that evolves with shifting societal views as to what constitutes acceptable treatment or punishment. Many treatments, such as the death penalty or forced sterilization, were once considered to be acceptable for inmates and are now considered abhorrent by today's societal standards. And prolonged and indefinite solitary confinement has undergone a similar evolution. In 1987, the Ontario Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada agreed that the indefinite solitary confinement of a convicted child killer, Clifford Olson, was not cruel and unusual. But thankfully, a lot has changed since the 1980s. And primarily, we now have the benefit of extensive psychological literature like that of Dr. Smith at trial, attesting to the inhumane and harmful effects of solitary confinement on an individual. And I would quote Justice Bonato in the CCLA in Canada case, speaking for the Ontario Court of Appeal, that as society has become more informed about the harms caused by solitary confinement, the public's views have changed. And this year, in that case, a unanimous court, Ontario Court of Appeal struck down segregation legislation because it authorized, though did not mandate, the imposition of solitary confinement lasting longer than 15 days in violation of Section 12. And the court reached its finding in part by applying international norms set out by the Mandela rules. And these rules, which I referenced earlier, prohibit prolonged solitary confinement, which lasts longer than 15 consecutive days, and indefinite solitary confinement, having no fixed duration under any circumstance. Some treatment... What's the, what's the impact of these, uh, of these rules on Canadian law? Should we... Uh, does that have the same importance than any other jurisprudence? We do not rely on the Mandela rules um, in any sort of binding way. They are not binding on Flavellian courts. However, they have been considered by a number of courts in considering society's general shift in views under Section 12. Um, they were considered in that manner in CCLA in Canada and Ogamian in Ontario, and it is for that purpose that we rely on these rules.
My friends, the Attorney General, rely on a number of legislative safeguards within this legislation that they say save it from violating Section 12. It is our position that these safeguards are entirely inadequate to prevent cruel and unusual treatment. And my submissions on this point can be found at paragraph 52 of the Appellant's Factum. First, phrases like no reasonable alternative or what is reasonably required for security purposes do not save the legislation from violating Section 12. As the Ontario Court of Appeal noted in CCLA in Canada, when considering similarly drafted limits in administrative segregation legislation, while these phrases may provide meaningful guidance to prison officials, they do not preclude the possibility that an official will apply their discretion as it is written in the Act and nonetheless conclude that what is reasonable is to leave an inmate in isolation for longer than 15 days. As long as this possibility remains authorized by the legislation, it is the Act that must fail. Second, mental health care under this regime is entirely inadequate to prevent harms. And this is for a few reasons. First, institutional heads are not required to consider mental health either when admitting an inmate to structured intervention or when contemplating their ongoing placement. And in the CCLA in Canada case, the Ontario Court of Appeal noted that in that legislation, institutional heads were required to consider mental health, but because that was not the paramount consideration, that was still found to be insufficient. But in this legislation, institutional heads are not even required to consider it. But isn't there a provision in the legislation that they have to be seen by someone in mental health, the mental health um, department within 24 hours, and that person has the ability to trigger a review that might ultimately be an external review in a shorter period than 90 days? Uh, yes, Justice Davis, that's true, but might would be the operative word. Um, one of our other problems with this mental health care regime is that the recommendations of healthcare professionals are not binding and can be ignored by institutional heads. And apart from that initial 24 hour check after immediately being transferred into structured intervention, further monitoring by a healthcare professional is not mandated by the act until harm has manifested outwardly in that the inmate has already deteriorated and a CSF staff member has noticed that harm and referred the case to mental health care staff. And this is simply insufficient to, to prevent the harms of solitary confinement. In an institution, though, where safety has to be a primary consideration, can you really have a mechanism where the health care team can dictate how the institution has to be run? Wouldn't that um, jeopardize the safety of the institutions? Um, perhaps not. but. That is why we are here asking for hard limitations on the discretion of prison officials to place inmates in segregation for longer than 15 days and to utilize these exceptions for longer than 15 days, limitations which are not present currently within this act. So while it may be that mental health professionals cannot um, be permitted to run the institution, this is why these hard limitations are necessary. As a final note with respect to mental health care, even a perfect system of mental health care applied in good faith by prison officials would not be sufficient to cure the act of its constitutional deficiency under Section 12. And that is because, as the Ontario Court of Appeal recognized in CCLA in Canada, mental health monitoring is not capable of preventing or predicting harm. It is only capable of addressing it once it becomes obvious that the inmate has already has already been harmed. And that's because psychological symptoms often do not present outwardly until it is far too late, if at all. And I would note as a final point that inmates in Flavel on the evidence before this court have a widespread and pervasive mistrust of CSF staff, which often inhibits them from communicating openly about their mental health. And this further contributes to the deficiency of the mental health care regime. With the balance of my time, I would like to address our arguments on Section 1, and these can be found at paragraph 59 of the Appellant's Factum. Because of the importance of the interests that these rights protect, the Supreme Court of Canada has repeatedly disclaimed the possibility that either a Section 7 or a Section 12 violation could ever be found to be justified under Section 1, and indeed the Court has never found such a violation justified. And this is not the exception to that rule. 
Inmates hold very little in the way of liberty or substantive rights that they may assert against the state. To deprive them of their fundamental charter rights would require extraordinary justifications, such as the outbreak of war or a national emergency, as the Supreme Court of Canada has opined in Sharkawi in Canada. These circumstances are not present in this case. The appellant does acknowledge that the objectives of improving safety and security within the institution are pressing and substantial, and that short-term segregation may be necessary in some cases to respond to the exigencies of prison management. But the cost of prolonged isolation is simply so high that a law that authorizes it and does not safeguard against its harms can never be considered to be minimally impairing. And that is our primary submission under Section 1. Your, your friend mentioned one could hardly doubt the, the importance of ensuring prisoners are properly cared for. Uh, your friend points, though, that it points out that an extraordinary amount of money has been spent under this new legislation already to create a better environment. And there's, isn't there a, an, an argument to be made that you, you have to leave some discretion in the people charged with the administration of prisons to look after and, and assess the circumstances of inmates rather than attempting to, to micromanage it from this court? Absolutely, Chief Justice Strathy. We do recognize that some discretion constitutional discretion is necessary within the prison context in order to respond to those exigencies of managing prisons and that prison administrators have expertise and competency in that area. However, it is the courts who are entrusted with interpreting and applying charter rights and that discretion must be conferred in a manner that conforms with the Constitution. And that means that it can, cannot be conferred in a manner that expressly or by necessary implication authorizes charter infringing conduct. That was the standard set out by the Supreme Court of Canada in Slate Communications and Davidson. And in this case, the exceptions enumerated in section 37 sub 1 expressly authorize CSF officials to leave an inmate in solitary confinement in a number of open-ended situations and the absence of a time limit or any meaningful limits on this practice authorize the prolonged nature of solitary confinement by necessary implication. With respect to the financial resources that Flavel has channeled towards this regime, we do recognize that a significant amount of money has been put towards developing and implementing the Structured Intervention Act. However, the government has not demonstrated that those resources could not be put towards other less impairing alternatives, as is the required standard under the minimal impairment stage. And those include some of the solutions that I canvassed earlier, but most importantly include time limits and prompt and ongoing independent review. Finally... You seem to, you seem to go back to this independent review quite a few times, just like your colleague uh, did, did. So, in your opinion, there is no uh, useful uh, review inside the institution of by C CSF uh, personnel. You need external review. Um, Does that mean judicial review only, or it could be something else? Because there, there's there are a cost issue, there is a delay, there is access to justice issue also. What do you mean by independent? What we mean is external, and that was this court's holding in 2017 when it struck down the prior regime. It mandated that external oversight be provided of CSS decisions, um, and it's primarily that which we require for independent review. We do not require judicial review necessarily. Our primary concern is that independent review comes soon enough to prevent the permanent harms of solitary confinement, and that it be external to CSF. But all the time, the inmate could have access to judicial review if they're not satisfied with the decision, habeas corpus or otherwise. That's not enough? It's not enough, Chief Justice that's Wagner. A, that's independent? It is independent, but it that's comes... external? It is external, but it comes too late. Um, and that is why in both the BCCLA in Canada case and the CCLA in Canada case, those courts um, rejected the argument that either judicial review or habeas corpus was sufficient as a remedy. The rapid onset of the harms of solitary confinement mandates something sooner. Couldn't that, those applications be brought as soon as someone's put into structured, um, the structured intervention program? Uh, perhaps, Justice Davis. However, this court has the opportunity 
to cure a structural and a systemic problem with legislation in Flavel that authorizes prolonged and indefinite solitary confinement in violation of the Charter. And I would note, in conclusion, um, in asking you to strike down this act, that courts have repeatedly recognized that for the Charter to work meaningfully for vulnerable groups, it is not sufficient that the free exercise of their constitutional rights depends upon their ability to bring litigation to the courts. This is why we have Section 52 Sub 1 to strike down laws as, a, as being of no force or effect, which are inconsistent with the Charter. Thank you. Carson or Mr. Midman. Yes. Good evening, Justices. My name is William Maidment, and along with my co-counsel, Eileen Church Carson, I represent the respondent, the Attorney General of Flavel. The Structured Intervention Act is a carefully designed system that provides for safety and security within Flavel's prisons. It is the product of extensive dialogue with this court about the Charter's constraints on the separation of an inmate from the general population. It is this dialogue that has led Parliament to place definite and narrow parameters around the use of structured intervention. And it is for this reason that the court should affirm the constitutionality of this regime. The Structured Intervention Act preserves scope for the expertise of the correctional services of Flavel while ensuring that structured intervention is available only as a mechanism of last resort. Furthermore, the Act strictly limits the form of structured intervention that deprives inmates of meaningful human interaction to situations where a further layer of exceptional circumstances render the provision of that interaction unsafe or impracticable. And Parliament has created this precise tool because the failure to identify and mitigate the complex and dynamic threats within prisons endangers the life of inmates and CSF staff. My submissions concern the Structured Intervention Act's compliance with Section 7 of the Charter, in particular, the principle against overbreadth and the duty of procedural fairness. My co-counsel will address Section 12 and Section 1. But Justices, before I move into the Section 7 inquiry, I'd like to say a few words about the precise administrative architecture of the Structured Intervention Act and the precise dispute between the parties in this appeal. The Act empowers CSF officials to make two distinct administrative decisions subject to two distinct standards of justification. First, they may decide on the basis of Section 34 that on the basis of safety or the protection of an ongoing investigation, there is no reasonable alternative to the removal of an inmate from the general population and their placement in a structured intervention unit. Can the Correctional Service of Flavel um, make a decision not to have any other alternative so that they create the circumstances in which there is no reasonable alternative? Justice Davis, on our view, the injection of no reasonable alternative into that statute is to ensure that CSF objectively believes uh, or subjectively believes on a reasonable basis that there is no alternative. So that instance you describe would fall outside the ambit of the discretion that CSF officials are lawfully if they conferred. Are if they don't apply their discretion properly. Well, if they, make, the if they make a mistake but they've behaved lawfully, uh, the system of review that I will detail later in these submissions will kick in uh, and we'll identify that mistake. And if there is a reasonable alternative to structured intervention unit confinement, this act will require their release from the structured intervention unit. Can I, um, just back on this no reasonable alternative, um, the evidence seems to suggest that a disproportionate number of people with mental health issues end up in structured intervention. Um, if the correctional service doesn't um, invest in mental health services, and people have symptoms that manifest in behaviors that can create security concerns in a prison, 
aren't they going to end up in structured intervention and won't it be uh, a proper exercise of discretion because the funds haven't been put towards creating what would be an appropriate alternative such as a you know a therapeutic environment for someone to be treated in and Just so it would fit within the exercise of discretion that's possible, Justice Davis, but the mental health screening at 24 hours after placement exists to identify precisely those inmates and to call for a referral either to a more appropriate institution or to alter the conditions of confinement so that that individual uh, is not subjected to treatment that uh, negatively impacts their mental health. Um, your, your friend's submission seems to be that, one of them seems to be that each of the exceptions in 34 sub 1 <clears throat> authorizes a situation in which solitary confinement right. will take place for more than 15 days, which the evidence <clears throat> indicates causes immediate harm to inmates. Do you take issue with that factual statement? Justice, we don't. Uh, section 37 sub 1 does provide three kinds of reasons to impose deprivation of meaningful human interaction, and I'll take you to those that aspect of the legislation now. 30, 34 sub 1. The exceptional circumstances, I believe, are 37 okay. sub 1, and the okay. initial port of entry into structured intervention okay. is 34 sub 1. So okay. I'll move to 37 sub 1 now, Chief Justice Straffy. Okay. Uh, it's true that the act also empowers CSF officials, once they've made a placement under Section 34, to decide that the conditions of confinement must be altered such that an individual isn't granted the opportunity to interact. But this subset of decision making requires an exceptional justification beyond what was required to justify the initial placement under Section 34. And these considerations that justify limiting interaction below the two-hour threshold on which our friend's case is predicated this evening are restricted to three classes. First, where that individual refuses to avail themselves of the opportunity to interact with others, a situation that by statutory design necessarily creates a duty for a CSF official to refer that inmate's case to a mental health professional. Second, where that individual does not comply with reasonable safety instructions. And third, in a prescribed set of exceptional circumstances that frustrate the ability of CSF to effectively and safely administer the space for that interaction. Who gets to prescribe those circumstances? Does the correctional service get to prescribe them themselves? They do, Justice, but allow me to assuage your concern by detailing the statutory, of princi the statutory principle of interpretation that governs that open-ended list. Uh, so the listed examples of those exceptional prescribed circumstances, riots, fires, and natural disasters, are all unified by the common thread of a time-limited abnormality of circumstance that makes it difficult or impossible for CSF to administer interaction. And it's true that this list is open-ended and that Parliament has not prospectively articulated every instance in which uh, such a circumstance will arise. But the principle justum generis should guide this court to conclude that the only circumstances that lawfully fall within that category share that common characteristic of time-limited abnormality. And so it is only similarly exceptional circumstances that will count as lawful reasons to deprive an inmate of interaction. What about staff shortages in the institution? Would that be analogous to a work refusal? Uh, staff shortages, if uh, we had data on the, uh, their incidents, uh, I may be able to offer a more clear question to that. Uh, but if it were the case that a staff shortage in the highly unlikely event persisted for 15 consecutive days or rendered the provision of that uh, interaction genuinely unsafe, it's possible that it might rise to the level required for that exceptional justification, yes. Doesn't that get back to the question I asked a minute ago, which is that the correctional service can essentially orchestrate circumstances through their own resource allocation that will justify the ongoing imposition of solitary confinement or structured intervention? Justice Davis, on our view, the creation of a situation that renders uh, interaction unsafe would fall outside the conferral of discretion that Parliament has undertaken here. Uh, but 
it is true that CSF must be able to respond to the operational realities of a given institution. And so if there is genuinely an administrative challenge that renders it unsafe to provide for interaction, then on our view, Parliament should, uh, CSF should be able to respond to that through uh, the exceptions detailed in this act. That brings us to the square number one, is to what extent those decisions can be reviewed by impartial and independent body. Uh, you know, people make mistakes, everybody do. And uh, if they're wrong, if CSF is wrong for many reasons, and uh, would that be a more efficient process to have uh, some kind of external review, independent review? Not necessarily by a judge, although a judge is probably the best uh, system, but uh, other type of review. Well, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Wagner, uh, Flavel has provided for external review in this act, and it comes 90 days after placement. So the dispute in this appeal is not whether the act's provision of external review is appropriate. It's whether uh, it must come 85 days, uh, whether it must come five days before placement or at 90. So uh, isn't it, I mean, clearly 90 days, by 90 days, there's a risk of a very serious harm. Isn't bringing for suppose you brought the independent review to 15 days or 10 days. Isn't it just a matter of cost? Uh, Chief Justice Strathy, that's not the rationale that I would cite for the particular policy choice that Parliament has made. Uh, the technical nature of structured intervention unit decision making and the extremely high stakes of uh, making those decisions correctly renders it appropriate and indeed procedurally fair to vest decision-making authority in the early stages of a placement to the individuals who have that training and who have that expertise. Surely the, the argument is that the reason to make it independent is the institution has a vested interest in decisions it's already made. That's why you need somebody who's independent. And Chief Justice Strathy, that's why this act has remedied the procedural defect under the Segregation Act, where the same individual could investigate, make a placement decision, and then affirm their own wisdom in a subsequent placement decision. But the layered system of review under this act, in which review is undertaken by increasingly senior CSF officials who have the legal authority to make their own technical safety decision about the reasonable alternatives available in a given case renders that defect and renders this act procedurally fair. If after 90 days there's an independent review and the independent review says that someone could stay in structured intervention, when's the next review and by whom? As I understand it, Justice Davis, uh, the system of review reverts to the original timeline before the 90-day review. So I believe there would be another review in 30 days by a senior CSF official. That's the system contemplated by the Act. Or you'd have to go to the courts. To yes, that, that writ of habeas corpus is all, always available to and those individuals. And you say it's available at every stage, so at the five-day 30-day, 90-day, you could independently review each of those decisions? Yes. Or one could independently review Yes, them. that's correct. I'll move now to my submissions on overbreadth for a few minutes before uh, returning in more detail to procedural fairness. And these submissions begin at paragraph 31 of the respondent factum. Overbreadth is an inquiry into the relationship between the objective of a law and the effects flowing from the means by which it pursues that objective. And a law is overbroad when it authorizes a deprivation of a Section 7 interest which bears no relation to its objective. The Structured Intervention Act seeks to secure two important objectives, the safety and security of inmates and staff within Flavel's prisons, and the integrity of ongoing investigations into criminal conduct or serious disciplinary infractions. In order to sustain its claim of overbreadth, the FCLA must deduce the existence of at least one individual who is brought within the ambit of this act in a manner that does not advance either of those objectives. And this claim cannot be met in relation to this act. The FCLA argue that the SIU's operation is overbroad in two respects. It authorizes extended placement where short-term placements will satisfy its objective, 
and it authorizes placement not on the basis of safety, but on the basis of administrative challenges, especially associated with transfer. I'll address these in turn. The Act's contemplation of extended placement is rationally connected to its objective. To achieve its objectives, the Act must allow for placement for as long as there is no reasonable alternative to the safety threat that motivates that placement. The FCLA argue that the law is overbroad because it hypothetically authorizes confinement beyond the short term and even beyond 15 days. But this position belies the complex and dynamic nature of the threats to which CSF must respond. And the facts of the Queen and Aziga are illustrative of this point. In that case, prison officials were confronted with an HIV positive inmate who had a history of biting other inmates and staff members in all moments he was not in close confinement. And medical health professionals has, had designated him for placement to medical segregation. And until that was arranged, he was in a segregation unit. What the FCLA asked this court to hold is that on the 14th consecutive day, there may be a persuasive rationale for denying that individual the opportunity to interact with others, but that on the 16th consecutive day, that persuasive rationale disappears. This court should not affirm that view. To the extent that there are some safety threats which exist for more than 15 consecutive days, this act is not overbroad because it contemplates a response to those safety threats. Is there any obligation on the correctional service to um, demonstrate that it has taken steps within the 15 days or 30 days or 90 days to find some alternative, to demonstrate that they've done something that has been unsuccessful or looked at some alternative? Well, for the Section 37 sub 1 exceptions, they're under a daily obligation to uh, determine if that individual uh, can interact with others safely. So in the case I've described, Section 36 creates a statutory requirement to determine on a daily basis if that interaction can be provided. And it is only when CSF determines that it can't on that day that the resort to Section 37.1 will be authorized. So they are under a duty to attempt to provide for conditions of confinement that do not deprive inmates of interaction. And it's only when those attempts uh, in the CSF's eyes would not be successful and would not be safe that this confinement will be authorized under Section 37. I'll move now to the second issue of overbreadth that our friends detail, which is whether sensitivity to administrative challenges severs the rational link between structured intervention unit placement and the Act's objectives. And I'd like to first say that the difficulties of transfer are never themselves sufficient lawful reasons to deprive an inmate of interaction. It is only when one of those three exceptional circumstances in section 37 sub 1 is engaged that that interaction will be denied. What this act does is allow CSF to pursue safe prisons by managing the relationship between particular inmates and the general population. The complexities of finding an institution that is acceptable for a given inmate uh, and physically transferring an inmate there may require that the CSF be sensitive to the challenges endemic to that practice. And so SIU decision making I, is I, not. My, my problem with that goes back to the issue of resources. Surely uh, if sufficient resources are deployed, transfers can take place without impairing the mental health or further impairing the mental health of vulnerable prisoners. Uh, sensitivity to those administrative concerns, Chief Justice Strathy, uh, will never authorize the kind of confinement that the evidentiary record before this court suggests has those negative mental health consequences. So while the CSF may extend placement on the basis of finding an appropriate institution, they may never use that as a reason to impose the deprivation of human contact that is essential to our friends' contention on security of the person and on mental health harms more generally. 
But if they don't, if an institution has an individual like the one you've described, who's intent on biting someone and has decided that they are not safe to interact, if they don't invest some resources in something other than structured intervention, won't they have that justification every day indefinitely? And is there some obligation on the, the service to come to actually demonstrate that they are trying to come up with an alternative as opposed to simply saying, well, we have a situation where we can rely on the exception. Justice Davis, as I understand this legislation, it, it does not impose that obligation. But this appeal is not a referendum on every aspect of Flavel's administration of prisons. It's simply the question of whether, in whatever regime Flavel chooses, resort to this tool of extended confinement should be available. So this court need not conclude that every pocket of Flavel's prison administration is sufficiently resourced in order to conclude that this act is not overbroad to the extent that it takes administrative considerations uh, to be uh, relevant to the question of whether an inmate can safely interact with others. And Justices, I see my time has come to an end, and I'll cede the floor to my colleague. Thank you. Ms. Carson. Good evening, Justices. My name is Eileen Church Carson, and I will be delivering the respondent submissions on Section 12 and Section 1. Our submissions on Section 12 begin at paragraph 50 in the respondent's factum. To begin, Flavel concedes that placement of individuals in segregation constitutes treatment engaging Section 12. For that reason, my submissions today will focus on the infringement stage of Section 12 analysis and I will explain how the Structured Intervention Act does not authorize cruel and unusual treatment and therefore complies with Section 12 of the Charter. Under Section 12, treatment is cruel and unusual if it is grossly disproportionate to what is appropriate, or put another way, if it is so excessive as to outrage standards of decency. The Supreme Court of Canada, in cases such as the Queen and Boudreaux and the Queen and Lloyd, has emphasized that this is a high threshold. Merely excessive treatment is insufficient to meet this bar. Moreover, the Su Supreme Court of Canada explained as early as the Queen and Smith that Section 12 requires evaluation of the particular circumstances of a case to determine what range of treatment is appropriate, and then that range should be compared to the treatment applied. This is a fact-specific inquiry as context changes, so does Section 12 analysis. Our argument under Section 12 with respect to the Structured Intervention Act will have two parts. First, I will explain how the Structured Intervention Act only authorizes solitary confinement for 15 days or more in situations of pressing safety concern. Second, I will explain how such treatment is not grossly disproportionate in circumstances of pressing safety concern. Notice that you've used the word authorized in referring to the, to the test. And is, is that the test or is it a, it, whether the act uh, permits or allows for a solitary confinement in reasonably foreseeable situations? So the use of the term authorizes is to connote that this is a test of whether the legislation is constitutional on its face. So whether the discretion afforded by this law um, is constitutional. And the assumption of discretion is properly exercised, is that it? I will describe the confines of the discretion um, delegated by this act, but yes, it is our submission and indeed it is not our friend's contention that maladministration can premise um, a finding of unconstitutionality for this law. Um, as the court determined in Little Sisters' book, An Art Emporium in Canada, 
Parliament is entitled to proceed on the basement basis that enactments will be applied constitutionally by the public service. So the issue before this court today is whether the authority delegated, um, specifically under the provisions in 37.1, as that is the area where our friends take the most issue, um, go too far and are beyond what is authorized under Section 12, and is our submission that they are not. So the first part of my analysis under Section 12 begins at paragraph 58 in our factum, and this is how authority to use solitary confinement is constrained by this law. The Structured Intervention Act remodels Flavel's segregation regime, ensuring that inmates have access to meaningful human contact for a minimum of two hours, but perhaps more, within structured intervention units through programs and services that respond to an inmate's needs and support their reintegration into the general population, or alternatively support their correctional plan. And Parliament has invested $300 million towards that end to establish new facilities, and it has earmarked $58 million annually towards training and staffing of structured intervention units. Under the Act, an inmate's right to meaningful human contact can only be limited under the narrow exceptions listed in 37.1. As my colleague explained, these exceptions are narrow and limited to instances of pressing safety concern, either where an inmate refuses to respond to reasonable safety instruction or in exigent, unpredicted circumstances that limit the ability of staff to maintain security and safety within an institution. These exceptions must be evaluated on a daily basis, and this means that any extension of confinement cannot be authorized for a day longer than is responsive to a safety concern. How does the language of Section 37 um, consider or require the service to take into consideration the reality that mental illness may cause someone to fall within one of these exceptions? such that you have someone who's mentally ill, who can be justified under this basis, who then is the person who's going to be most at risk of the harmful effects of what this authorizes. So to answer your question, I'd like to step back and look at the legislation as a whole, as this is a complex regime designed to address a complex problem with competing interests of vulnerable people both inside and outside of segregation. The mental health regime, um, review regime designed under this act requires review by a mental health professional within 24 hours of placement in a structured intervention unit whether or not an inmate is subject to solitary confinement under 37.1. With that review, mental health professionals, healthcare professionals, are able to make recommendations to the alteration and, and subscribe conditions of confinement. Those conditions can only be disobeyed by CSF staff if there is an additional review process with an independent committee and that committee will be provided with independent medical evidence provided by a different medical practitioner. Um, so with that in mind, we have to look at how these different provisions work together. It is possible that an individual will remain in a structured intervention unit after this mental health review, but those conditions are ongoing and officials are bound by them if they are upheld by um, an institution head. But the daily visit doesn't have to be by a healthcare professional, does it? That is correct. And it doesn't have to be someone who is trained in mental health at all, right? It does not. However, I would add that under Section 37.11, that provision details specific situations where that staff member must make a referral. Um, and there is no discretion under that provision for the official to, pr to do otherwise. If an individual refuses to interact with others, if they engage in self-injurious behavior, if they show symptoms of drug overdose, or if they show signs of emotional distress, a referral must be made. Now, Flavel acknowledges that notwithstanding all of these off-ramps and safeguards, it is possible that an individual could be placed in solitary confinement for a prolonged period. However, we emphasize that this is only authorized in exceptional circumstances where interactions with others jeopardize safety. And this brings me to the second stage of our arguments under Section 12. Just before you move to that, then, could I ask you, are you effectively acknowledging that, that uh, the legislation 
uh, authorize grossly disproportionate treatment? We are not, and that is specifically the second stage of my analysis, which is why that treatment and that possibility is not, in fact, grossly disproportionate. It is our submission that where solitary confinement is used as a tool of last resort in instances of pressing safety concern, it does not meet that high bar of being grossly disproportionate to what is appropriate in the circumstances. And I emphasize um, in the circumstances as we take a different position on the appropriate Section 12 test than our friends. Our friends emphasize in their submissions that the focus of Section 12 analysis is the effect of treatment. However, the other part of Section 12 analysis is first determining what treatment is appropriate in the circumstances and comparing treatment applied and its effects to that initial treatment, or that, in, that those circumstances and what the treatment is, is called for in those circumstances. Your, your friend refers to the decision of the Court of Appeal for Ontario and the Canadian Civil Liberties Association test, which has some resonance. Uh, how do you distinguish that case, or do you say the legislation has accounted for the problems identified in that case? So we distinguish from that case, I'd like to address your question in two parts. First, by why this is different and why the test that I've just outlined applies here and does not um, run against the CCLA decision. Um, so this case is distinct as um, the Court of Ontario Court of Appeal in that case was considering a regime similar to the previous regime that was enacted prior to this legislation, one that automatically authorized 22 hour per day segregation on an ongoing basis and did not have the mental health review procedures and um, guarantee of four hours and two hours of meaningful in human interaction without except <clears throat> outside of these exceptions that exist under this regime. It is a distinct regime where different effects took place and where solitary confinement was authorized in a broader set of circumstances. And we know from um, Section 12 analysis in the mandatory minimum context that when we're looking at treatment being considered in a Section 12 challenge, we get to look at all of the reasonable hypothetical implications. Here, the reasonable hypothetical scenarios where this treatment can apply has been narrowed significantly. Um, so the set of circumstances where it is being applied is very distinct from the CCLA decision. And I would like to use the example of how circumstances were considered um, in Alberta when looking at treatment um, a specific treatment of the forcing inmates to wear baby dolls, which is a garment smock that is difficult to tear. Um, in the cases of Trang and Alberta and the Queen Man and Minos, the court looked at the same treatment with the same effect, wearing of that garment, but came to a different conclusion because of different circumstance. In the Trang and Al Alberta case, the treatment was deemed appropriate and within the scope of Section 12 because it was responding to situations where inmates had been determined to be suicidal, and wearing the garment prevented them from being able to create a noose. In the Queen of Minos, the court determined that that treatment was unconstitutional because it only served to humiliate inmates. Circumstance informs Section 12 analysis, and it informs Section 12 analysis here as well. When we're dealing with a narrower set of circumstances where this treatment can be used, different from this court's analysis under its decision in 2017, and different from the Ontario Court of Appeals analysis um, in 2017 as well. Can I just ask you about a reasonable hypothetical? Um, isn't it a reasonable hypothetical that a profoundly mentally ill inmate with stubborn symptoms that manifest themselves in behavioral issues will be the sort of inmate that would fall within this regime and be subject to ongoing prolonged segregation? And if you take that inmate, wouldn't the expected treatment be some therapeutic intervention? And if you compare that to solitary confinement, don't you get dis gross disproportionality? That presumes that the mental health safeguards that exist in this regime do not direct that inmate outside of treatment and presumes maladministration, I would suggest, of those provisions. And I say that because... Or lack of resource allocation to those issues. Which may not, which I think is different than maladministration, isn't it? Perhaps. I would emphasize that what is at issue here is whether the tool that has been authorized by this legislation is constitutional. And we should not be looking at whether or not there are alternatives until the Section 1 stage in addressing these issues. So it is whether 
in a situation such as the one you've detailed, what is appropriate and what happens under this law are grossly disproportionate treatments. And I think it would be helpful to turn to several Canadian examples where this form of treatment, section, um, solitary confinement in response to a challenging safety circumstance was upheld under Section 12. I'd like to begin by quoting the British Columbia Court of Appeal in the Br British Columbia Civil Liberties Association case, where Justice Finch wrote that the significant challenges associated with preserving life and maintaining institutional order mean that in limited circumstances, humane segregation of some inmates will be both necessary and justified. Which paragraph is that? In the decision? Yes. Um, I believe it's paragraph four. It's early in the decision. Okay. And Canadian courts have upheld this treatment in application when looking at particular circumstances where they could consider the safety circumstances at issue. In MacArthur and Regina Correctional Center, an inmate was returned to segregation on three occasions after assaulting three guards and threatening and assaulting staff and destroying government property. And arrangements were being made to transfer him to a facility where he would undergo anger control measures. But in the meantime, the court determined that his continued placement in segregation for an extended period during a day was constitutional under Section 12 as it responded to those circumstances. My co-counsel detailed the case of the Queen and Aziga. A similar finding was found there. In the Queen and Olson, there was reasonable grounds to believe that an inmate's life was in direct danger within the general population because he had con been convicted of crimes against children and youth, and for that reason he was a target by other inmates. Moreover, he had assaulted other inmates and staff when allowed to interact with others, and for that reason the court determined that solitary confinement conditions were constitutional and they were not grossly disproportionate to what is appropriate. This is contrasted to cases where courts have found solitary confinement conditions unconstitutional under Section 12. For instance, in the case of the Queen and Priste, solitary confinement for over one year was held to be in violation of Section 12, but in that case, the court stated that the length of time that the accused spent in segregation went beyond what was necessary to achieve the legitimate government aims of safety and security. Now another point of difference in our submissions and those of my friends is that they submit that the appropriate way to limit use of this treatment is with a time constraint. We recognize the serious concern of the safety risks that are involved in placing inmates in such conditions. However, we submit that the proper manner to constrain such treatment is through administrative discretion and the narrowing of the justifications where it is authorized. And this is because- a, a good review, independent review. That comes in, correct, yes. We would not sacrifice the safety of inmates based on, by applying a rigid standard or time limit, which would be correct for 99% of inmates, but would pose a safety threat that is reasonable and known for 1%. Justice Laforey stated in The Queen and Bear that discretion is an essential feature of the criminal justice system and a system that attempts to eliminate discretion would be unworkably complex and rigid. If there are no further questions regarding my Section 12 submissions, I will now move on to the Section 1 stage of my argument. Our arguments on this point begin at paragraph 71 in the Respondent's Factum. Under Section 1, I will focus on justification of Section 7 as Favell concedes that Section 12 breach likely cannot be justified under Section 1. And while a law that offends the principle of fundamental justice under Section bears a serious blemish, this does not preclude justification under Section 1. And this is following the Supreme Court of Canada's obiter in Carter in Canada, where the court highlighted the difference in interests considered under these two inquiries. Section 7 looks specifically at the impacts of a law on an individual and benefits to that individual. Whereas Section 1 balances the deleterious effects of a law on an individual's rights against public good. And Justice Wang in the decision below stated that significant public good flows from the Structured Intervention Act. The record in this case shows that 33% of inmates in the general population of Flavelle's prisons prior to 2017 
experience threats of assault. All inmates benefit from limitation of safety threats in Flavel's prisons. And we would emphasize the, that this act prevents safety threats posed on vulnerable inmates, both who are placed in segregation themselves and those who are in the general population. It is their rights that we are balancing here in addition to the safety of CSF staff members. That sounds a bit like a, a submission that the, the, the rights of some can be violated because it's beneficial to the rights of, of more than some. It's almost a greater good argument. Rather, I would like to highlight that it is a serious balancing of equally important rights rather than a more broad public good flowing from this act. So it is not necessarily a quid pro quo type thing, but rather um, emphasizing that there are people on either side of these decisions who are equally vulnerable and their, their safety is of equal importance. Although we have evidence that on the one side you have the risk of permanent harm to someone's mental health um, if you permit prolonged segregation. So h how do you say it's in the public good to allow a government institution to permanently harm someone's mental health when they themselves, if the information is true, were likely vulnerable when they were in the general population as well? It is our position that there is public good from creation of safe and secure prison institutions. And the public that we are referring to is not the public at large per se, but all those who are implicated within administration of the prison system in Flavel. So individuals whose lives are protected by separation from others. I see it that comes I'm- down, It comes down to the question of cost at the end of the day. And to what extent uh, a violation of Section 12 can be saved under Section 1 for costs. I see that I've reached the end of my time, if I may have an indulgence to answer sure. your question. It does not come down to a matter of costs per se. This act falls with a, in a range of reasonable measures to address this complex issue of safety and maintenance of security within Flavel's prisons. And in fact, the government has invested significant resources into implementing this regime. And the issue before this court is whether this regime and this approach falls within a range of reasonable measures that could be taken to remedy this issue. If there are no further questions, that concludes my submissions. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to, um, I'd like to thank all the councils for their submission, very good submissions. You won't be surprised to learn that the court will take the case under advisement. Uh, there will be maybe a dissent, we don't know. <laughs> We're used to that. So um, we'll come back in, uh, in a few minutes. Thank you very much. So the court is now in recess. We would just like to ask everyone to remain in their seats until the justices do return.
So I'm happy to report that we have a decision. <laughs> it is unanimous. You are great. <laughs> um, I would invite my colleagues to, uh, to provide you with some additional comments, but I'll start just to, to give you a few words of my impression. Um, you know, I was a litigation lawyer for 25 years. I always said, although my colleagues and my partners in the corporate and uh, non-contentious uh, department were not in agreement, but I always said that litigation lawyer was, litigation was probably the most challenging and interesting aspect of the practice of law. I still believe it. And looking at you, I'm sure that you have a great future in that litigation if that's what you want to do. Why? Because you already master some of the basic, uh, of course you are prepared. Obviously you are very well prepared. You could refer to the proper jurisprudence. You always maintain eye contact with the judges. That's very important. People who read their documents will never be uh, convincing. So you have to be convinced to, to be able to convince other people. And, uh, and uh, you know, obviously you, you you were able to exchange with the judges without, without any doubts, and it takes some good preparation to do that. So I, I, I'm, I'm really impressed, and I, I'm looking forward to see you uh, at the Supreme Court very soon. <laughs> George, I don't know if you, uh, or Brice, if you have uh, other comments. Thank you, Chief. Uh, well, this case has a sense of deja vu to me. <laughs> I, I felt all the while that I was uh, I was reliving history. Um, I heard the case in the uh, Court of Appeal for Ontario, and I spent the, the last week actually was since Monday uh, hearing appeals in our court, a steady week of criminal appeals, and I can tell all four of you you would not be out of place in our court in our courtrooms. Uh, you did a fantastic job. Um, you're also comfortable, you seem to be enjoying it, uh, which is either great acting or true. <laughs> uh, but you seem, you all seem comfortable, you weren't glued to your notes, you know, so many moots that, and I do a lot of moots, uh, so many cases you see people stuck in their notebooks and you weren't, you were so confident of your material, you had such a clear pathway that you were going to follow that it was a kind of a comfortable dialogue. You weren't thrown off. We tried a little bit to, to hit you from the center from the, and from the wings, and we, we couldn't move you off your, uh, your course, and that was really impressive. I think I was, I was very impressed by your knowledge, not just of the case law, but of the, of the record itself and your ability, your comfort, and the ease with which you went back and forth from your, your case books to the... Uh, to, to the, respond to questions. Um, you, you obviously enjoyed the process. Um, you know, the, the, the thing about oral advocacy when you get to the, the level of the Flavel Court of Appeal uh, or any appellate court is that really um, it's a dialogue with, with the bench. Um, you're never going to make the submissions that you plan to make from day one. Uh, and so you have to respond to the concerns that the court has. And the, the concerns of the court, you, should, you welcome them because it tells you what the court's worried about. And the, you embraced our, our concerns. You, know, you made us feel like uh, you had anticipated them. You had solid confidence, confident answers for them. So. 
it felt like I was at work, you know. <laughs> it, uh, you made us, you made us all work. So I certainly enjoyed it. Thank you all. I said when we went back into the room was I wish I was that prepared when I argued cases when I was a lawyer or I wish the lawyers that came before me were as prepared as the four of you were so uh, you just did an amazing job um, we will be lucky to see you in our courts uh, within the next few years so I'm looking forward to that um, what I thought was amazing is you seemed to enjoy it more when you were answering questions and you were, when you were preparing, when you were reading sort of how do I get from point A to point B in my script. And that, I think, is a sign of a, a really well-prepared advocate that you, you have a plan, but you're more interested in what your decision maker wants to talk about than what you want to talk about. And you, see, you all seem more comfortable when you were in that mode, when we were asking you questions. And I also thought it was amazing how much you could all get pulled off course without being pulled off course. Like we would ask you questions about issues, we'd ask you, we'd ask you to come back to issues you'd already thought you'd moved on to, or we'd ask you something from your colleagues area, and you never seemed to be out of place in what you wanted to do and how you wanted to, to deal with the issues. Um, so your confidence was great. Um, looked like you were having fun. I hope that continues if you have a litigation career. I hope you enjoy it. Um, and if you can not show nerves the way that you didn't show nerves today, um, it will be very, it will do you well in your career because you, none of you look like you were nervous. Um, and I'm sure you were. Um, but as I said, we will be lucky to see you in our courts in the next years, to, in the years to come. Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> or comments, or uh... maybe to spur a few questions, or to give you a chance to think about that. I'd like to make a pitch, uh, a paid public announcement. If you're interested in advocacy, anyone, uh, come to our courts. Come and watch our courts in action. Uh, you can watch the Supreme Court of Canada live on on webcasts or telecasts. Uh, watch good advocates, and you, they see the best advocates, and they go outside <laughs> as well. They decided in Winnipeg last week. Come down to Osgoode Hall and watch what goes on in the Court of Appeal. Come down to, to Osgoode Hall and 361 University Avenue and watch what goes, on, what goes on in the Superior Court. You'll see some good advocacy, and you'll see some great advocacy, and you'll see some bad advocacy. <laughs> but the thing is, you'll be able to tell the difference. And I'm quite serious. There are the best classrooms in the country for advocacy, and if you're interested in a career, then come and see us. You'll be more than welcome in our courts. That's a very good advice. Yes. A it's shy classroom of 100 <laughs> <or> so. <laughs> The, one hiding, the, one hiding the one's hiding the under the table. <laughs> we saw that from the start. <laughs> so my question for you is, what is the impression that each of you has, if I may, of the very finest advocates that have appeared before you? What do you remember about them? Want to go first, George? I tell the story of an advocate who, and some of I may have told it to some of you before, but an advocate who held up a prism, figuratively, a prism in front of me and twisted it around until I saw his argument in an entirely different light. And that skill of, of making the judge see the case in a whole new way, that to me was transformative. And, uh, I can remember the moment. I won't tell you what it was, but I remember it. Well, any, any lawyer will, will be able to uh, choose his or her battles. In other words, we, we have de facto. We've got, we've got, we, we read it. But when it comes time to oral arguments, that's when the lawyer has to tell you why, you know, I have to agree with him or with her. And, uh, and, uh, uh, oral arguments is, is, is a bit, uh, I, I use the word uh, in French, is uh, la séduction. You have to be seductive, but the, the right way, the proper way. 
uh, you have to bring the, you, you have to bring the judge to ad, to adapt to adapt your reasoning. So it takes talent, uh, it takes experience, it takes preparation, but uh, those are the best moments. Well, I haven't been doing this long enough to feel like I have much credibility saying what really good advocates are, but uh, from my limited time on the bench, uh, I would say some combination of patience to explain your argument in a, in a sort of methodical way, confidence that you're right. I mean, you, you, I, as an advocate, I used to go through the phases of I was convinced I was going to lose, um, and then I was absolutely certain I was going to lose. And then by the day that I went to argue it, I wanted to be certain that I was right. And so I think you have to be confident in your position by the time you get to argue it. And um, a real sense of um, pride in the institution that people are involved in, that this is a decision-making process that's that requires good advocacy, that requires people to participate in the process. And so a combination of all of those things, I think, make a great advocate. Other comments, questions? We would just like to thank you, Justices, for your very kind words and for the opportunity for everyone to ask questions. Um, we did just want to take a brief moment before we conclude to recognize the contributions of everyone who assisted with making tonight's moot possible. We would like to thank all of the faculty who helped us with organizing all of these logistics and attended run-throughs, in addition to other run-through judges who are also mentioned on page six of the program. We would also like to thank all of our bench clerks and the other moot court committee members for all of their assistance with organizing this event. Their names are on page five of the program. And of course, we would like to thank our distinguished panel for contributing their time and their valuable feedback. And in exchange, we do hope that you will accept a small token of our appreciation. And finally, we would like to express our, our gratitude to McCarthy Tatro once again for their longstanding support of the Grand Moot uh, and their generous contribution of their resources, their time and expertise, uh, which continue to make this fantastic evening of mooting a possibility. Uh, with that, we would like to invite Daryl Cruz to uh, say a few words on behalf of McCarthy's. Thank you very much. Um, it is our pleasure at McCarthy's to sponsor the Grand Moot. We've been doing it for a very long time, and I was trying to figure out how long, and I can't do that, but I just realized today that my colleague Glynis and I did this moot 30 years ago in the fall of 1989, and McCarthy sponsored the event back then, um, and so it's longer than that. Um, but um, it's our great pleasure to do this because we believe in advocacy and believe in the adversarial system and the training of advocates, and this school is a great place for that, and this mood is a fantastic exercise in advocacy. And um, we also like to thank the judges. Um, judges have, the judiciary has consistently supported this event over the years, and we've always had fantastic, fantastic panels, and this year is no exception. And to the mooters, uh, you did a fantastic job. Um, it's great to see this, and the future of advocacy obviously is in great hands. And uh, it's our, our pleasure again to watch it and to support you guys through this process. Um, and we have little uh, tokens of our appreciation as well. Let's see. Julie, Spence, Will, Elaine. Thank you very much.
finally, I think we have a word from our mooters. So I know that I'm the only thing standing between everyone and uh, food and alcohol, so I'll be very brief. But I just want to echo all of the thanks that were said. Uh, this event could not be possible without McCarthy's, our professors, everyone who did run-throughs, our friends and family, and of course, the justices. Uh, last but certainly not least, Sue Rao and Alyssa Holmes worked tirelessly over the summer to write this problem. They were dedicated coaches, uh, and we really could not have done it without them, so we have a small gift. Thank you. <laughs> With that being done, we would like to invite you all to the reception, which will be taking place in the Rowell Room. You can find it all the way out in the other older side of the building. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. <laughs>